Jeremiah 23, 25 through 32. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and leave Lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them, so they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. There we go. I'm back on. <clears throat> Got a few announcements today. Uh, upcoming September 15th membership class. So if you're interested in being a member here at Pella, we have to talk about that. Uh, September 15th, I believe it's the 10 a.m. service. We'll have our membership class. So if you're interested in that, you want to be part of that. So you, I think there's ways to be, be. I think we can sign up through the QR code. I think is that how we do it? Yep. Getting this thumbs up on that. Yep. Also want to mention in terms of our children's ministry, uh, some uh, books that are being offered this month in terms of uh, that you can purchase. I, I know the Five Solas, an interactive theology book and theology for children. The Five Solas. We're doing a series on the the Five Solas of the Reformation. Um, so I the, I use these in my sermon preparation, so they're really good. Um, Oh, come on, even 7.30 laughed harder than that. Come on. I think they're just, they're just politer than you. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. And so uh, if, you wanted, if you want to get those, the, they're off, there's a QR code in the, where the children are uh, by, the, by the, the bookshelves there. So the QR code, they have all the books that are listed for this month. They're recommending for this month for children of different ages. So there's different categories there. You can see that if you're interested. Also, I was told, I was asked if I would invite you both the 845 service and the 10 a.m. service, if I would invite some of you to attend the 730 service. Next week, we're expecting an influx of students again. So with the, the, these two middle services are really packed. So if some of you would hear the Lord speaking and maybe want to move to the 730 service to make some room here for those students, that would be great. So if you at least consider doing that, that would be helpful for us as a church and uh, as a body. We are entering into a five-week series on what are called the solas of the Reformation. And we're looking at this issue of the Reformation in terms of uh, this reclamation, this gospel reclamation project that un we underwent. As, as Protestants, we recognize this is a, a good and glorious thing. It was a callback of the church to important truths. It wasn't an attempt to be innovative, say something new, but rather to, to call the church back to its source. As a matter of fact, one of the sola, I mean, one of the Latin phrases that was associated with the Reformation was called ad fontis, back to the sources, back to the sources of Scripture, back to the source of the early church. Let's root ourselves in these things because they believed that there had been these incrustations that had grown upon the teaching of the church and had led the church astray. So we affirm those solas. We want to begin a series on that. So I'll be working through sola scriptura today for us. What does it mean to say scripture alone? So let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we do thank you for your kindness to us. We ask that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, your word is a fire. It is a mighty hammer that can even shatter rocks. Lord, would you stir us up? Would you even discern the innermost pieces of who we are now? Would you, Father, send your spirit in the name of your son, Jesus, and teach us. Lord Jesus, feed your sheep. Give me utterance, I ask in your holy name. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. We know the beginnings. It's usually the, of the Protestant Reformation. We usually dated at October 31st, 1517, when Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg. You know, began this, uh, this challenge to papal indulgences, the, the way that you could simply buy uh, forgiveness. There was a means to actually buy forgiveness to, to purchase grace that way, and Luther called that into question with 95 Theses. You can go find those online. They're worth reading. After he did that, and being pressed by other theologians as to what he was saying, don't you realize you're challenging the Pope? Don't you realize in there, because of that, you're challenging certain councils that had, had made declarations about the power of the Pope? 
you know, that you were calling to question the authority of the church. And so it, it forced him to wrestle with the issue of authority. Where is authority found as we preach and teach to God's people? So that was 1517, the 95 Theses. Then in 1521, at the, what's called the Diet of Worms, he's, he's there, he's called to give an account. He is before the emperor, which is a big deal. He's before the electors, he's before other theologians. They're there. He thinks they're there to, to talk about things. <clears throat> they're there, they have him there so he can recant. You need to repudiate everything you've said. And they have all of his books laid out in front of him. And they say, you know, are, are these your books? And he had, a, he had a lawyer with him. They, they, the, 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 the school he was part of, say, hey, we're sending a lawyer with you. Lawyer says, like lawyers do, objection, you know. How do we know these are all his books? So they read each one, went through each one. And they said, yep, those are all mine. Somebody said, you're lying, Luther. Nobody writes that much. No one single man can write that much. But he did write them all. And so they said, will you recant? Will you say, I repudiate everything I've written? At this point, we think he's going to stand up and he asks, well, can I have a day to think about it? And, so, and they gave him a day. So the next day he comes and he begins to talk about, I can't repudiate all of them. Some of, the, some of them are just devotionals and nobody would want to, why would, you, why would I repudiate devotion to Christ? And so they, they finally say, hey, stop all of that. Will you recant? We're done. And his famous answer was this. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the Holy Scriptures or by evident reason, for I can believe neither Pope nor councils alone. As it is clear that they have erred repeatedly and contradicted themselves, I consider myself convicted by the testimony of the Holy Scripture, which is my basis. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Thus I cannot and will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. God help me. Amen. What we have here is sola scriptura in action. I'm living in accordance with Scripture. I will not be bound by these other things necessarily. So sola scriptura is one of the slogans of the Reformation. And slogans have a, a tendency of being simplified and then confused. Uh, slogans are sort of like, <clears throat> if you think, a suitcase. You've got a suitcase that says sola scriptura on it. You know, but we, occasionally we need to open the suitcase and unpack what it means, unpack what, what, what's all entailed, unpack what, what we're not trying to say with Sola Scriptura and all the slogans. So that's what we want to do in these next few weeks to unpack these. So Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, but in what sense? How should we understand the alone part of Sola Scriptura? Here's a definition I want to work with for our purposes today. Sola Scriptura means that only Scripture because it is God's inspired word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. Definition by Matthew Barrett. Here we notice three things. It is inerrant. It is, that means without error. Because it comes from God, there is no error in it. It is sufficient for the purpose of salvation and godliness. What you need to know to become saved, to have a relationship with the living God, to be in covenant with Him is found in Scripture. How to live before Him in a holy manner, that's found in Scripture. It's sufficient for that. And it is the final authority. It is the ultimate authority. Which means we can recognize other authorities. But they're always subordinate or under Scripture. That's what Sola Scriptura is. Reformed theologian James White helps us by understanding what sola scriptura is not. There are certain things that are, are said about the Reformed tradition, particularly by the Roman Catholic tradition, you know, that'll say, well, you people believe this, and many times they misconstrue it. And so sola scriptura is not the claim that the Bible contains all knowledge. You know, it's not a science textbook, it's not a manual for governmental policies. Uh, it's not going to tell you how to balance your checkbook. There's, there's wisdom that can be had from other sources. So it's not that it contains all knowledge. It's not a claim the Bible is an exhaustive catalog of all religious knowledge. I mean, we know this from Scripture itself. In John 21, 25, there were things that Jesus did that were not written down. And so we know it doesn't contain everything that possibly... It's not exhaustive in the sense of what it could have been. Sola Scriptura is not a denial of the authority of the church to teach God's truth. It's not simply, oh, Sola Scriptura means it's every individual, just me and my Bible. I need nothing else. Well, no, we need the church. The church has a certain authority to teach God's Word. 
It's not a denial that the Word of God has at times been spoken. It's not saying, well, only, it can only be written. Sometimes the Word of God has been spoken in the past, and we'll see examples of that in our sermon. It does not entail the rejection of every kind or form of tradition. Protestants can affirm tradition in a certain sense. We'll see that as well. It's not a denial of the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding and enlightening the church. People say, well, Sola Scriptura means you've got everything you need, so you don't need the Spirit of God. Well, no, we need the Spirit of God to enlighten our minds, to confirm and under, uh, we can understand the Scriptures. The Reformers were very adamant about that. Matter of fact, John Calvin himself was some, has been called a theologian of the Spirit. Because when you read him about on Scripture, he says the only thing that can uh, uh, affirm Scripture and affirm the authority of God is God himself by his Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to see the Scriptures for what they are. So he affirmed the power of the Spirit. We need the Spirit. So it's not a saying, oh, we just, we, need, we just need paper books in front of us. We need the Spirit of God. Again, the definition of Scripture, sola scriptura means that only Scripture, because it is God's inspired word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. Now, we are about 500 years, 500 plus years after the beginnings of the Reformation. So there's been a lot of theologizing, a lot of talking, a lot of thinking, a lot of debate, a lot of polemics back and forth, and lots of Scripture to consider. So we can only begin today to lay out some of the biblical reasons which led and lead, continue to lead, the Protestant tradition to affirm sola scriptura. So what I want to do is I want to look at a few scriptures, why the, the Protestant Reformation, the Reformers, began to move in this direction and, and make this claim about scripture, this theological move of sola scriptura. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. We'll see laid out here the beginnings I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, so maybe different than what's on the screen or in front of you. You, however, verse 14, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, Paul speaking to Timothy, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Notice, first of all, just in verses 14 and 15, this call to remember. Remember for where, where you've learned these things, Timothy, and you've become convinced of. Um, you've known the sacred writings. That's the Scriptures. The sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The purpose of Scripture is that we might be led someplace, not just, oh, we've got, some, we got a way to adjudicate you know, theological debates. No, it leads us to the wisdom that leads us to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There is a deep interconnectedness between all the solas. When we start talking about sola scriptura, only Scripture, once you begin to compromise the doctrine of Scripture, you will begin to inevitably begin to compromise other areas, such as sola fide or sola gratis, by grace alone. Or solus Christus, by Christ alone. These scriptures, God and his economy has designed them that they would lead us to Christ. That's what he wants it to do in our lives. So if we compromise scripture, we'll no longer be able to serve its purpose that God wants to have. Notice this, I just mentioned this as, as an aside, verse 15, and that from childhood, Timothy, he could tell Timothy that. He knew, child's, he knew Timothy's childhood history, his backstory. From childhood, the Greek word is brephos. It means an infant, a baby. In the story when Mary comes before Elizabeth and the Elizabeth, the John leaps in the womb, my baby, my brephos, leaped in the womb. It's even for the, the preborn. You've known the scriptures from the time you were a, just a baby. What a privilege, which is why we spend so much time with our children. We have children, we, we, we recommend the books, we say, here's the scriptures. And I get it. And hopefully in your homes, parents, you're, you're reading the scriptures to your child. And it's like, well, there are only two. They don't get what's going on. It doesn't matter. May it be said of them, that it would be true to be said of them, that they've never known a day they didn't know the scriptures. They were from the time they were a baby. It's important for you to keep reading the scriptures to them. They could have that legacy. Look at verse 16. All scripture... 
all Scripture. This is primarily a reference to the Old Testament, the, the graphe. Every time you see that word in, in the New Testament, the Scripture, it refers to the actual Scriptures, the written Scriptures. And all these Scriptures, he says, are inspired. They're inspired. And actually, I think the ESV actually captures the, the word better. Uh, scripture is breathed out. The Greek word actually has that connotation. It means not simply that he breathed into words. There was human words, and he sort of added a spicy a spice called inspiration. But rather, what these words are is like God has spoken them himself. That's a pretty powerful claim that all Scripture is inspired coming from God and it's by God, inspired by God. And here, here's where we see the authoritative nature of Scripture. Because God is who He is as the God over all things. He has authority over all things. All authority comes from God. You know, Paul will tell us in Romans 13, if there's any authority, it is derived from God. But He is the authoritative one. When He speaks, it therefore has authority. So these are inspired by God, which is where we derive from that these concepts of inerrancy, and infallibility. Inerrancy is that scriptures are without error. God does not lie. So when he speaks something, it is not a lie. It's also infallible. It's incapable. It's a stronger term. It's incapable of error. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It does something. In verse 17, what, what does it do? So that the man of God or the person of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And this speaks of scripture's sufficiency. If you have the scriptures uh, taught and correctly understood, you have what is needed for, for godliness, for every good work, for training in righteousness. It's sufficient for that. It's not like, hey, it takes you part way, and then you need other things. Now, we need the Spirit of God, but in terms of the cognitive content that God wants to give to us, it's the, this is the source. And the Spirit of God enlightens us to understand the Scriptures. We have to be sanctified and be walking with the, with the Spirit, you know, that we might also live a life of godliness before Him. But in terms of what the content of what God is giving to us, it's the Scriptures. So the summary point here is that inspiration by God entails the authority of God and therefore the sufficiency of the Scriptures for us because they're inspired. That's our first point. Our next point is this. I just want to notice in Scripture that Scripture repeatedly makes the distinction and marks out this distinction between God's Word and mere human words. Over and over and over again, we can look at a number of passages. We're going to look at just maybe a two in particular, and we'll see a third one. That, that there's God's words set over against man's words. So we want to make sure, what, what am I getting? Am I getting mere man's words, or am I getting God's word? That's a powerful thing, a claim. So that's where our text was that we read, had read, was Jeremiah 23. If you'd turn back there, I want to look at a pat, one of the verses that we didn't look at. 23.16. Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. Why? They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. What's happening here? There was a group of people. They're called prophets. They're not true prophets. But kings would gather around them, religious people. Hey, you speak for God. You get messages from God. You know things about God. And these, pro and these prophets in this context were, were, were stating lies about God and about what God's people were supposed to do. They were actually confirming them in their sin. And Jeremiah, as a true prophet of God, is calling them something else. He's calling them to repentance. They don't want to listen to him. And God, speaking through his true prophet, says, This group of prophets speak a vision of their own imagination. The word is generated from within themselves, their own imagination. He's going to talk about dreams. They dream to dream, and that is just simply, it's, it's what comes from the human only. And God says, they did not speak from the mouth of the Lord. It, my words, my words. We saw that in verse 25 and following. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name. Here's what they say. I had a dream. I had a dream. I had an experience. I've got something to, to say because of this experience I've had. God says, how long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, 
which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal. These prophets, speaking in the name of God, speaking merely human words, actually lead God's people away from the purity of devotion to who He is. Lead them into disobedience, even extreme disobedience of idolatry. This is the danger of letting the word of man sort of trump the word of God. To, to, to say it has the, the power to say this, this is more important or this is an additive. So we see that in Scripture. I just want us to see that this is a reality that happens to the people of God all over the place. God tells us about His word in verse 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer which shatters a rock. It does things. It's powerful. He had mentioned what does straw have in common with grain, or I think the ESV said wheat. It's like the word of man is simply straw. It doesn't feed, whereas wheat it has you know, power to feed, and you can make food out of it. So God is declaring that His word has the primacy. Beware of human words that will be added to or in place of the Scriptures, God's Word. Jesus has this same perspective. Jesus picks up this perspective hundreds of years later, and He has the exact same perspective. In Mark chapter 7, if you turn there, Mark chapter 7, Jesus is speaking, and the, the Pharisees are going to be challenging Jesus based upon human words, their traditions. Mark 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. Then there's a parenthetical comment in verses 3 and 4 where Mark sort of tells us, here's a little background of what, what I just said. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they had come from the marketplace... They do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they, they have received, that's a tradition, in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. So the Pharisees, now back to the story, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And here's what Jesus says. And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. He's quoting right back to Scripture. 700 years before him. As it is written, this is Isaiah 29, 13, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. Again, quoting Scripture. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I, ha I have that would help you is korban. That is to say, given to God. I've, I've dedicated it to God. You can't have it, mom and dad. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus, invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many such things as that. Again, the distinction between God's word and man's words repeatedly. Verse 7, doctrines versus precepts of men. Verse 8, commandments of God versus traditions of men. Verse 9, commandment of God versus your tradition. 10 and 11, Moses said versus you say. And verse 13, the word of God versus your, versus your tradition. And again, the idea here is you could, it's possible that the religious leaders, those that are seen most close to God, the Pharisees, can actually have a word that is created from their traditions. They would have recognized these are good and holy things, and they become, become layered upon the word of God so that it actually leads to disobedience. Or sometimes more leads to the omission of obedience. I don't need to do follow that command because of these other things that have been layered on top of the authoritative scriptures. And this is human tradition that comes in, and Jesus is making this distinction. There is the Word of God, and there are traditions. What about tradition? It's the Protestant tradition that we're part of, the Reformation tradition. We've already said that sola scriptura does not entail the rejection of every kind or form of tradition, right? There's a place for tradition. Well, what place should it have? And I think the words here of Kevin Van Hooser are helpful, give us a helpful metaphor to understand how traditions can help the church and not lead us astray or away from Scripture. He says this, Tradition has no independent capacity to communicate light. 
Tradition is rather the moon to Scripture's sun. What light the moon gives is always and only a reflection of the sun, yet it is real light. Indeed, a full moon casts enough light for a pilgrim to find her way. Tradition has a derivative, secondary, or ministerial authority. You'll see this word ministerial um, versus magisterial. Ministerial is like, magisterial is like the, the word of the king. The ministerial word is like the, the, the authority and the word of one of his ministers, right? And so tradition is ministerial. It's not the king. It's not the, the ultimate word, but it serves the word of the king. So it's ministerial authority insofar as its creeds and confessions rightly reflect the light that shines forth from the biblical text. The church exists in part to pass on this light. So there is a place for the authority of the church. There's a place for the authority of tradition as it reflects the scriptures. And this is when you look at the early church fathers. They had this conception. Now Rome will look back at that and say, well, look, look they mentioned tradition. Therefore, that almost justifies anything that we put out as tradition. That's just not the case. But there is a place. The confessions and the creeds of the church, they don't have ultimate authority, but they do have authority because they're, they're a reflection of Scripture. They're attempting, you know, so the, some of these basic confessions early on, like the Apostles' Creed, very simply stated. But then there will be people that want to come in and say, well, no, I think Jesus really wasn't God. Or I have this idea of Christ. And the church would look and say, well, that's not what the Bible says. And they would go back and they would debate the text of Scripture in terms of what, what's the truth. And then they would create uh, confessions or creeds to honor that. So, so here's, here's what is, is the Scripture is saying in the, for our context. And so it had a derivative authority because it was rooted ultimately in the ultimate authority of Scripture. So we, we affirm you know, different creeds and confessions. Not all of them because, as Luther pointed out, sometimes they do conflict. Not everything that is a confession or a creed of the church deserves to be considered such. There were claims that were later on made and where the authority was given to a man, the Pope, and, and that was over the top. So Luther would say, that conflicts with other creeds and confessions and more importantly, conflicts with the writing of Scripture, which is the ultimate authority. Here I want to say something <clears throat> very briefly just about a passage that is sometimes brought up that has said, hey, you need to honor tradition. Roman, the Roman Catholic tradition will point to this verse. They'll say, look, hey, you Protestants, in your own scripture, it tells you you should listen to the tradition of the church that has developed. And they'll take you to this scripture. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. I want to at least look at that real, real briefly. 2, uh, 2, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Here's what it says. So then, brethren... Stand firm and hold to, to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. And the claim is this. Look, you've got two sources here. The traditions, right? You've got the scriptures, the, the, the written, a letter, mentions letters, so the written word, but then there's also this oral word, taught by word of mouth. We've got these two sources, see? And it says... Hold fast to the tradition. You Protestants don't do that. You, we, we have this tradition that you completely reject. You're violating the Bible. That's the claim. What do we say about that? As a matter of fact, this passage in particular, um, <clears throat> there was one gentleman who was raised in, uh, went, was at a, uh, an evangelical, you know, reformed seminary doing his training there. and do, was doing some teaching then to some students. He wasn't himself a teacher yet, but he was doing some teaching and one of the students brought up this passage. He was challenging the Sola Scriptura, and he brought up this passage. It says the professor began to sweat. And this, this was the beginnings of his journey into Rome because he said he couldn't, this, this passage was, shook him. I don't think it should shake us. If God's saying something here we need to listen to, but it's not what the Roman Catholic tradition says it says. What do we, what do we say here? Look. James White, I think, helpfully articulates what's going on here. He says, the first thing we note is that this is the command to stand firm and hold fast to a single body of traditions already delivered to the believers. There is nothing future about this passage at all, nor does Paul say to stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that will be delivered. Does he, does he say to hold on to interpretations, understandings that have not yet developed? No. This oral teaching to which he refers has already been delivered to the entire church, not just to the episcopate, not just to the bishops, but to everyone in the church at Thessalonica. So what we have here is a single body of tradition centered in the gospel, I'm going to argue in just a second, 
that is delivered in two different ways. It's the same message delivered in two ways. Because why? It's delivered orally. He came and preached to them. Because it'd be odd if you were to stand up in front. It'd be odd if I stood up in front of you to preach today. And instead of preaching orally, I wrote notes down and handed them out to each of you, right? But same, same message. But then he, when he's later away from that city, he writes the same thing. I want to remind you what I spoke to you. What is it I spoke to you? The gospel. Why do we see that? Look, in fact, I want to show you contextually why I think that's the case. First Thess- Go to 1 Thessalonians. That the traditions he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 15 is a reference to the gospel proclamation that he originally gave them. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you yourself know. Just again, the gospel came to you. First piece. Go to chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it's, as it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. That's the gospel, right? And go back now to that passage in 2 Thessalonians. Thess- Thessalonians, excuse me. We looked at verse 15. Let's go to the verse right above it. He says this, It was for this that he called you through our gospel, that you might gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Nothing about a developing tradition that is given by the authority of the church for later generations and millennia. Simply but what I've already delivered to you. I gave you the gospel. You receive the gospel as the word of God, which is what it was. It wasn't just the word of man. It was the word of, it's that that which can save you. Called you through our gospel here. And then he says, hold to these traditions. Hold them. What's what's the tradition? That which has been delivered to you. What was delivered to you? I gave you the gospel. I gave you truth about what the end of time was going to be in terms of, even he mentions the Antichrist and this man of lawlessness he talks about in that. He says, matter of fact, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 5, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? It's the, I'm writing to you the same things I already told you. So what we have in Scripture is what Paul was talking about. It's not like, oh, you should be looking for ongoing tradition to develop. That has no connectedness with Scripture. I think that's what's happening when he tells us to hold to the traditions. There's much more to say. You can imagine the back and forth amongst these things, amongst theologians over the last 500 years has been intense. But I want to end with a quotation from J.I. Packer and then a statement from the book of Acts. J.I. Packer, a theologian of the Reformed tradition, says this. He speaks of the necessity of upholding Sola Scriptura today, and he says, "It it is inescapable that as this principle, Sola Scriptura, determines one's whole account of Christianity, so one cannot abandon it without one's whole view of Christianity changing, more or less at a fundamental level. Where you find and place the authority, Protestant Reformation says, God authorizes himself. He speaks, and then by his spirit, he testifies to the truthfulness and the authority of that. The claims of Rome are that, no, no, we testify, we, we sort of sanction that authority, and we have almost like this independent. Now, they would say not, they, they would claim it's not independent from God, but in practice, that's how it works out. And so rather than sola scriptura, what you have is, as some theologians have said, sola ecclesia, only the church. Because if the church is the final interpreter over this in an authoritative and infallible way with an ongoing tradition that continues to develop and says you have to accept that under pain of being anathematized or going to hell, you've moved away from the authority of Scripture. The Reformers saw that and said that's not healthy for the church. It's not healthy for the gospel proclamation. I want to end with a passage in Acts chapter 17. Paul was preaching. He had preached at Thessalonica. This is articulated in Acts 17, the we have the letters later to the Thessalonians. And there they preached the message. Some people believed, obviously, there was a church formed. And, but then he, took, he was persecuted. He was actually persecuted and beaten, and there were stones, and he was stoned and almost died. Then he moves on to the next city. It's a city called Berea. Verse 10 of chapter 17. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. He's going to preach the gospel. This is his custom. Verse 11. Now these, at Berea, were were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. 
Why? For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's the impulse of Sola Scriptura. I want to examine the Scripture daily. Now, it wasn't the, you know, well, Paul, he was, an, he was an authoritative, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He had authority. Yes, he did. And he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's an authoritative message. Yes, he is. So it's not like, oh, go, go to your home and read your Bible, and now we're going to sanction this. Well, what they were looking for, since this was new to them, was the consistency. Is this consistent with what we have revealed to us? That's the impulse of Sola Scriptura, that I will examine the Scripture daily. Somebody wants to make a claim, whether from an authoritative church source, for the, my own source, my best friend, from culture, whatever source it is, I will examine the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Does it match? Why? Because this is authoritative. This is inerrant. This is sufficient. That is the impulse of Sola Scriptura, and I pray it's the impulse of us here at Pella. Let's pray.